Okay, here we go. So what these are are not diets. They're food plans with a purpose for your whole life. And you'll see that when they do population studies, people who have followed these food plans for like 20 years, much better outcomes. So there are food plans that we can all follow that are going to help us out. We can't just follow them for next week. We really have to follow them for life. So we're gonna take a look. If you want weight loss, it doesn't matter what food plan you use. Any cockamamie one you'd like is fine. It's calories that count. But if it's hypertension, you gotta watch the salt and add the fiber. If it's diabetes, you really need to count the carbs and get more fiber in. And if it's dyslipidemia, you wanna check what kind of fat you're eating. So it's different if you have a different thing in mind. And so the first thing you ought to do with your patients is decide what do you and they want to do. Now, almost all of them wanna lose weight, but on the other hand, that's just calories, and we can tailor the diet to actually help prevent diseases here. And we just talked about the role of exercise, but you have to change behavior a little bit, and we'll chat about that. You know, we just don't know what humans should eat. We know what chickens should eat to make them crispy. Now, this is bizarre. We know what racehorses need to eat. Actually, I have a friend who has a PhD in poultry science, and she makes a big buck deciding what to give chickens so that they will fry better. Oh, what can I say? So we don't know much about humans because they don't eat what we tell them and they just, they just eat what they want. They may clean their own cages, but there are a lot of problems in studying humans and what they eat. So what's our purpose here? Mainly to prolong life, to provide adequate nutrition, and in most people to lose weight. So we're trying to prevent disease here. Now, do we need to do that? Oh, I think we do. Look at the, the, the states that have more than 35% of their population obese. And this is self-reported obesity. What's the actual obesity rate? Oh, gee whiz, not up there. 37.9 obese and 70% overweight. So when you do self-reported polls, people don't necessarily tell you the right answer. And, and you say, well, why not? Are they they're all liars, all these people? Well, uh, no, it's that most of us don't really know how much we weigh, that varies. And many of us don't know how tall we are. In fact, if you ask people, about 60% of people will give you a height and that's not the right one when you actually measure them. So self-reported statistics are not very reliable. What is reliable are the CDC statistics at the top of this page. And speaking of exercise, the leisure time physical inactivity belt here, look at that, that's just a dark blue, parallels our obesity chart. Right, so if you don't uh, exercise and you don't eat well, you gain weight. Okay, so having said that, the other thing that we talked about that causes weight gain are endocrine disruptors. And you wanna try and protect our children, particularly childhood obesity. Those hormones, or the, the hormone-like compounds that bind to the receptors cause adipocyte proliferation, particularly in children, and particularly phthalates. So again, this year, I'm gonna tell you about phthalates. They're in plastic as stabilizers, and when you heat plastic, with water in it, you will get phthalates. So take that water bottle out of your car. Uh, don't microwave in plastic cartons. Please be careful about that because it does add phthalates to your children's lives. Most of us, unfortunately, are past the time where you know not heating our water bottle in the car, or microwaving in plastic dishes, going to do much for our total weight. But in people under the age of 30, particularly want to look at that, want to make sure they aren't making themselves obese. And unfortunately, still in 2017, 40% of the packaging on fast foods and, and microwavable meals was still plastic. So you can find out about endocrine disruptors by downloading the Dirty Dozen you download the PDF and it will tell you how to protect you and your patients from endocrine disruptors that cause obesity. But our biggest problem isn't endocrine disruptors. Our biggest problem is that we just eat too much. We have no idea about portion control. When I talked to Head Start people, talking about what a three-year-old should eat, uh, it's a tablespoon of peanut butter, that's their serving. They said, oh, they just ate that, they'd starve. No, they wouldn't be overweight. So again, we don't have a good grip in the United States about portion control. Want to know where to look? Go to the cdc.gov website and they have a lot of information for you and your patients on portion control, on problems with endocrine disruptors. So they are reasonable to look at. 
So we said if you want to lose weight, then again, any diet will do. And this is a very good example of that. Turns out that if you look at weight loss with Atkins, Weight Loshers, Watchers, Ornish or Zone, they are all the same, about the same number of people stuck with it and about the same weight loss. There was no statistically significant difference in the weight they lost, no matter what kind of a diet they were on, as long as the calories were decreased. And this has been shown again in 2018 in the Diet Fit study. They looked at low fat versus low carb. No significant difference, really. You can eat whatever you want as long as you eat less of it and you will lose weight. If you want to lose about 5 to 7% of your weight, which is the average amount lost in a conservative weight management program, you can just do that by eating 500 calories less a day. And we don't care what they are. Any 500, just whap them out, and you will lose a significant amount of weight. Now, exercise helps you lose weight, but not as much as caloric restriction, because most of us can't exercise enough. It, we only burn about 75 calories for walking a mile. Oh, goodness, 75 calories. Why, that's not even a quarter of your breakfast muffin. So again, most of us just can't do it. Uh, for, again, group sessions are helpful. If your patients want to lose weight, they can go to take off pounds sensibly. You can run your own group. But face-to-face -face interaction, when your patients are trying to lose weight, very, very helpful. The group helps them have perseverance. It helps them to see how they're doing. If you gain 10 pounds, they notice. If you lost three pounds, they notice. So groups are helpful. For about 10%, you're going to add weight loss medication. And I didn't put that in here because it's the diet program. But any of you have problems with that, rest of you can go to the beach. I'll be happy to answer questions about obesity medications at the end. Okay. The other thing is timing is really important. And we're talking about that this morning in terms of menopause. It's a great time to say to people, OK, you're having menopause. Let's try a weight reduction program. Let's get exercising so we lose those aches and pains. You're going to have to change. Let's do it. So any time you have a, oh, a, a change in your lifestyle, be it menopause or moving or going off to college or unfortunately getting a divorce, there are changes that are going to happen in your life. Take advantage of them. Get on a new food plan. And when people say to me, and I say, why are you here to lose weight? And they said, my nurse practitioner, PA, doctor, family sent me. That is the wrong answer. You really have to be motivated to change your life. So circumstances are good. Times of life change that are going to happen, that are going to influence you, are also good times to take up a food plan. I don't take people in the obesity program who had previous sexual abuse, have an eating disorder, or have unrealistic expectations. And when I ask people, I say, well, how much do you think you're going to lose? And they, they weigh 200 pounds. They say, oh, 20 pounds would be great. If we use medications, you can use, lose 20 pounds. More than 20 pounds, we're talking surgery. So again, realistic expectations. 5 to 7% weight loss is going to improve your health. It's going to prevent diabetes. It will help your hypertension. There you have it. So think realistic as we go along. When you create your goals, you need to have realistic weight reduction goals. And what you have to do, how many of you actually are, are, uh, counsel people about weight reduction in your practice? Do you have, good, OK, there are the people who are left here, OK. So <laughs> let me tell you, first of all, you have to think of an exercise change and a food change that they're going to make. And they have to agree with that. It's like diabetes. You have to decide how many injections the patient will agree to. So you say, OK, we're going to do this. You're going to agree to do what? you decided to do. I'm going to eliminate ice cream from my life. OK, that's, that's a reasonable. You're going to use frozen yogurt. OK, that's OK. So that's your, your food change. And then you have to have exercise goals and behavioral goals. I'm not going to go out to lunch with the people in the office because I always eat 1,000 calories at lunch. That's easy, by the way. Get a Whataburger, it's uh, 1,200 calories. So uh, their big, they're big burger. So you're going to change your behavior. You need those three things every single time, behavior, 
exercise, food plan, what am I going to change, what do I agree with, and then you are going to write them in the chart or you'll forget them, especially if you have more than two people losing weight. So you're going to review them and you're going to say when are you going to do them, how are you going to do them. Everybody needs to know how they're going to happen and then you need to write them down as you do them at home. Please keep a diary. Do you know that just writing down what you eat decreases the amount by about 5%? You think, oh, should I eat that cookie? I'll have to write it down in my diary. No, okay. And then the next time they come, you need to review whether or not they've made this behavioral change. Very, very important. You need to see if they've really made progress. And if they did, you want to congratulate them. We give them things. <laughs> we have incentives. And they're trivial things. But people like to get little gifts. That's why you've been to the exhibitors, right? Okay. Then if they didn't reach their goal, you're never judgmental. You say, well, what seemed to happen? And reset it and go again. So that's what you have to do. And if you don't do your part, most people aren't going to do their part either. Now, how about losing more body weight, 10% of body weight? If people don't have chronic diseases, we help them use meal replacements. They're very effective. They're high protein, low fat. You can buy them over the internet. They'll deliver the, the whole meal to your door. They even give you a few free ones. Those are very expensive, but they're nutritionally adequate and they work. You can buy that food plan um, on the internet anytime. You can get a food plan uh, with you know, pre-prepared meals at a number of sites. Our pharmacy has an obesity plan. So you can t send your patients to one of those. And it's hard to do that yourself. So you're losing a lot of weight. You're probably going to have to join one of these programs. And once you get through losing the weight, and I have people lose 100 pounds on these programs over the course of about six or eight months. They lose it slowly, but surely. And how do you get off them? Well, you're going to use an over-the-counter, and I, you know, Orlistat. We'll talk about that in a minute. They also have protein supplemented fasting programs, which are about 800 calories, 800, 1200. But you drink a lot of water, you just eat that food, and you really can exercise, get minimal carbohydrate, adequate protein, and you can actually help people prevent diabetes. You can help them improve their diabetes, lose their oral agents. Mild diabetes simply goes away on these diets. So they're very effective. And if you have questions about them, I'd be happy to answer them. And I've run one of these programs as well. Um, they have some side effects. People can lose their hair. They get they have hair loss. And they uh, also have to be very careful that they don't overexercise. You have to follow their electrolytes. But these are very effective. And again, we transition them off using over-the-counter medication for uh, their appetite. OK, the problem with all food plans, and particularly these food plans that make you lose about 10% of your body weight, are that the sustainability is very poor. When the patient tries to transition back to the food they're not buying from the vendor or to the food they're not buying from you, they actually have a problem with increased fat intake every single time. And that can cause them to lose the incentive. It can also cause them to gain all their weight back. So in order to get them off, I use over-the-counter Orlistat. And you can use that on anyone who's doing a food plan with you or a, a diet. Very safe. How many of you have heard of that? It's called the Lee, a lie. Yeah, right. Are you using it? Yeah, good. Um, I think it works very nicely. And it decreases fat absorption by about 30%. You take it before meals, and then as you add fat to your food plan, it decreases the effect of that on your uh, weight. And it improves the lipid profile as well. Now, it does uh, decrease the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, so I tell them to take a multivite at bedtime. And it can cause oily, uncontrolled orange stool. So I tell them for about the first couple of weeks, you have to figure out how much fat you can eat, where it depends. And then after that, once you know how much fat you can actually consume, then you can go out into the world again without any problems or without any depends, and you'll do pretty well. So a lot of my patients do very well. They have good sustainability after their food plan, be it a food plan the dietitian designed or a food plan they bought over the counter or from us. 
and they will actually have a good sustainability and probably a 10% weight loss. The only other way you can get a 10% weight loss conservatively is use medication. Okay, so uh, again, Oralstat helps you with dyslipidemia as well, and it's been used to help prevent diabetes. So good plan for your patients with conservative management, and it doesn't require a prescription. Okay, now some of my patients for their whole lives decide to go on two meals a day of those protein supplements. They're about 80 calories a piece, and so they have maybe one for breakfast, two for lunch. They have a typical three to four ounce meat or meat substitute and 30 to 60 grams of high fiber carbs for their main meal of the day, and they have a very sustainable weight loss. I've had people on these for five. One person, I think, has been on it for 10 years. So you can use these protein supplements, and they do have good sustainability, and you have about, no, oh, seven to 10% weight loss on them. Okay, so what are we gonna do with, with nutritional therapy? Again, provide for long life, provide adequate nutrition, and weight reduction and prevent diseases. So, my patients all say to me, but I know what to eat already. Yeah, right, but you don't eat it. And the USDA guidelines for food plans, and you should have these in your office, it gives people a little thought about what's happening. Less than 10% sugar. Carbohydrates are 55% of the diet, but the sugar and the cupcakes, the frosting, the cinnamon rolls are a very small percentage of that. Protein is a milligram per kilogram per day. And fiber, you'd like 25 to 35 grams. The average person in the United States gets about 10 grams of fiber a day. No wonder your patients are all constipated. I have to tell you, there's no fiber in their world. Saturated fat, less than 10%. Is that what you eat? If it is, you're really unusual because the U.S. diet in 2018, according to the CDC, is a low-protein, low-fiber, high-fat, high-carb diet with 4,000 milligrams of sodium. Thank you very much. That's hypertension in a salt shaker. Okay. Oh, I know supersizing isn't your fault, but just because McDonald's has two cones for a dollar doesn't mean you have to buy, and one is, one is you know, a dollar or two or a dollar, they have the two for one special. Buy both and throw them out, one of them out. Better yet, throw both of them out. Okay, so is this really the shape of things to come? Will it be okay if we put his um, drink in a paper cup instead of a plastic cup? I don't think so. Are they really gonna put a tax on soda? Why can't I eat what I want, says the man with metabolic syndrome. Well, his healthier counterpart says poor dietary habits were associated with about 600,000 deaths, according to the American Heart Association, in the United States in 2016. And oh, this guy back here says there's no tax on fruits, berries, and nuts, is there? No. Okay. Okay, so what do we need to get rid of? Sugar sweetened beverages are the main cause of unhelpful food plants in the United States. We just Drink too many sugar-sweetened beverages. You still have your Pepsi down there? I, I noticed we're featuring Coke out in the, you know, right. Okay. Between 1970 and 2006, the sugar consumption in the United States doubled because we got high fructose corn syrup. Okay, high fructose corn syrup has been declared by the CDC to be one of the major causes of obesity and diabetes in the United States today. And what does your Pepsi or your Coke have in it? For the most part, high fructose corn syrup. But you can get those products without high fructose corn syrup. There was such a furor over this when the CDC made their recommendations that the Coca-Cola company now has two different kinds of Coca-Cola that have, one has cane sugar and the other one has a sugar substitute. So you can get Coke without high fructose corn. I'll bet you get Pepsi without it too. I have no idea how to Okay, and that's, what, that's the problem. Do you know that McDonald's will tell you how many calories in your food? Have you noticed McDonald's re menu has the number of calories? Yes. So I was in the airport one day and there was this huge crowd at McDonald's and I said, excuse me, uh, 
<laughs> I do research in nutrition. Could you tell me how many people are basing their purchase this morning at McDonald's on the number of calories that's right up next to it? And people said to me, oh, those are the calories? Oh, gee whiz. Oh, didn't look. No, no nobody. OK, so, so putting the calories right up there doesn't do a whole lot of good unless you really look at them. OK. This is about the only human study with high fructose corn syrup. It was only 10 weeks long, but it was very well conducted. And people drank three sugar-sweetened drinks, one with each meal. And there was the glucose group and the fructose group, OK? So the rest of it they could just eat. They had stuff out. They had uh, food out. And you would come in, and you could just eat what you wanted here. They all gained about oh, 1.4 kilograms, so a few pounds. And they all gained about the same amount of fat. But unfortunately, if you look at the high fructose corn syrup people in green, this is visceral fat. Oh my goodness. And if you looked at the glucose people, they had less visceral fat. And what causes metabolic syndrome? Visceral fat is where it's at. Hmm, hum, oh. Well, if we look at insulin resistance, oh, that went up much more strikingly in the high fructose corn syrup group. If we look at insulin sensitivity down there, high fructose corn syrup group, Oh, their insulin sensitivity dropped like a rock. So it's bad for you. OK, so let's talk about our microbiome. And I said I would limit this to just a few minutes here. But we like diversity. Remember that our gut has the largest number of autochthonous flora in the body, even though it's not, a very, it's not the largest area. So we like bio you know, variety here. We want some proteobacteria, some bacteroides. We want a few firmicutes. In people who have dysfunctional gut microbiomes, the bacteroides are decreased. You say, what good are they anyway? Bacteroides make short-chain fatty acids that cause your gut to be less permeable. And that's good, because less permeability means less inflammatory factors going out into the circulation, less bacteria going into the liver. The increase in gut permeability with decreased bacteroides is one of the major causes of fatty liver and NASH in the United States. Because things leak out, and where do they go? Into the liver. So if you want to avoid fatty liver, you got to get your bacteroides in a row. The other thing is that firmicutus thrives on fat. And if you eat a high fat, high sugar diet, you get extra firmicutus. What do firmicutus do? They make inflammatory factors. You want to make your HSCRP go up? Eat that McDonald's hamburger. Just go right ahead. So increased firmicutus, increased gut permeability, and increased inflammatory factors in the serum, increased NASH. So, how can you reset your microbiome? Well, it changes within 24 hours of a new eating habit, OK? And fast foods, oh, particularly fats, high fat, high saturated fat, really changes the microbiome fairly rapidly. So what do you want to eat? You want to eat well, fruits and vegetables, basically, are good, whole grains, nuts, vegetables, you know, nuts and berries, sticks and twigs. And avoid unnecessary antibiotics, please. They just wipe out your microbiome. Well, you know, Clostridium difficile. Where did that come from? Where does it usually come from? Antibiotics, right? OK. And so what do they do for that? They do a fecal transplant with good stuff, resetting the microbiome and taking care of that disease of 98% of the time the first go round. So reorganizing your microbiome is really good for your health, and you can do it. But you know, you don't want to eat fruits and vegetables and nuts and twigs all week long, and then eat McDonald's on the weekend. That won't do it. Remember, 24 hours. In addition to that, your endothelial function is dependent upon your food plan in large measure. And if, you, if your endothelium is dysfunctional, as we heard today, you will get plaque. <laughs> and plaque um, invades the arterial wall, becomes unstable, and can cause plaque rupture, which causes heart attack and stroke. So again, uh, inflammatory factors from your microbiome actually 
cause endothelial dysfunction. As we talked about, laughter and, and friendliness and camaraderie helps your endothelial function well. Tai Chi and meditation help endothelial function. So, dysfunction, hypertension, stress, hostility, anger, and ingestion of saturated fats. You want to make your endothelial dysfun endothelium dysfunctional about 12 hours a day. Just eat three high-fat meals. That's all it takes. Hypertriglyceridemia, which you see in people with metabolic syndrome, also causes endothelial dysfunction. But one of the good things that people are studying is arginine. Arginine is an amino acid that actually helps the endothelium function better. And so if you're on a low-protein diet, which you don't want to be, you're going to have lower arginine consumption. But people are taking arginine supplements. I wouldn't suggest that for you. But it seems that arginine is a good thing to have on board to have your endothelium function well. By the way, dark chocolate contains arginine. Just, just a little hint there. Of course, you want the non-sugar kind. So what's the plan here? Get rid of the sugar-sweetened beverages. And I have to tell you that Head Start has done a great job of that. The kindergartens are doing a great job. The problem is if the kiddo has a, uh, and I've seen kids coming into uh, Head Start, they have these big three liter uh, jugs of soda. It's almost as big as the kid. And they roll in with them. Well, Head Start takes those away when you come in. They don't serve any sugar-sweetened beverages. They don't even serve fruit juice very much anymore. But when you go out, they give it back. So not too good. So they have sugar-sweetened beverages are high calorie, and they have low satiety factor. We can drink a lot, a lot of sugar-sweetened beverages and still not be full. So how about our added sugar? What is the big source of added sugar? Well, soda. Get rid of it. Now, when we talk about the microbiome, I bet all of you counsel your pregnant ladies about what to eat, right? So they come into the office and you say, um, are, are you drinking sodas? You ask them. Because what, where do you think the fetus gets its microbiome? We used to think the fetus popped out and it was sterile, but it isn't. It has a microbiome. You know where it gets it? Obviously from mom. So if mom drinks soda, how soon is too soon to start giving your kids soda? I think in utero is a little too soon, if you ask me. And so tell your pregnant moms not to drink regular soda, not to eat a lot of concentrated sweets, and certainly not to use high fructose corn syrup if they can possibly avoid it. Oh, and the other interesting thing, they've looked at microbiomes in infants. When the, when the kiddo starts to uh, move around, of course, he has mom's microbiome and dad's microbiome. So when it begins to crawl around the floor, you know where the microbiome comes from? Mom, dad, and the family pets. Ooh. Actually, though, in the United States, dogs and cats are fed better than humans, and so probably it's just as well. <laughs> OK. So what can we do to improve your microbiome? And this is where we engage our patients. Really, they, they get into this. They say, OK, I can do this. It gives you control over your weight. So back to your question about what do I do with a patient who's losing weight and then you know, just don't know what to do. Well, you know, they've lost control of things. They say, oh, what's happening to me? I'm in menopause. I'm gaining weight. And I don't have any control over it. Well, this is a way you can actually get some control. You can change your internal microbiome. So prebiotics, onions, bananas, garlic, asparagus, they all promote bifidobacteria growth, which is really good, helps with constipation, and also helps to make short-chain fatty acids and make your gut less permeable. You can also, of course, use probiotics except that your gut and my gut are different. So we don't know which probiotic is going to do it for you. And there's a lot of research going on about this. Pretty soon, you're going to be able to give them a sample of guess what. And they're going to look in there and see what your microbiome is like. And then they can say, OK, you need that. And, and so pretty soon, it's going to be um, a science. Well, a smelly science. OK, so what probiotic do you use? 
How many of you use probiotics, just out of curiosity, or recommend them? Yeah, see, lots of people do. Um, and my friend who does a lot of work in NASH and, and gives people food plants all the time, says that she uses something called Culturel, uh, but there are a variety of them out there, and people are beginning to use them more often. Yogurt is a great prebiotic because it actually helps to uh, supply you with streptococcus, lactobacillus. Some of them, the more expensive ones, have bifidobacteria. And uh, of course, the one we all recognize that has a guarantee on it is you're not going to be constipated is down here in, uh, under bifidobacteria regularis. And, and that really pr works pretty well. OK, the other thing that everyone is emphasizing this year, the ADA had guidelines about sleep. Everybody needs about seven to nine hours. The best way to help your patient lose weight is to not have them be a shift worker, but certainly seven to nine hours of sleep. People lose more weight if they get adequate sleep. Because partly because decreased sleep leads to increased ghrelin, which says to you, that's, that's the gut hormone that says, I'm hungry, you've got to do something. And it can get to be very persistent as the levels get higher. It makes you hungry. You also have decreased leptin if you have decreased sleep. So, OK. Well, exercise, we just heard about that. And this is a slide that uh, Dr. Murphy didn't have. Uh, exercise is the art of converting big meals and snacks and, and fattening snacks into back strains and pulled muscles by lifting heavy things that don't need to be moved and running when no one is chasing you. So what does exercise do for weight loss? It's hard, we say, and to exercise enough. And uh, half an hour to an hour, five days a week is for good help. But for weight reduction, the sports medicine people last year said we need about 40 extra miles a week at about 50 to 75 calories burnt per mile to make an impact. Most of us just don't even want to think about that. But what exercise does, and, and for people who have lost weight, it really promotes sustainability. The people who continue to exercise after they have lost some weight sustain that weight much better than the people who do not. And the diabetes prevention trial showed that the people who continued to exercise after the trial was over did not get diabetes. Only 1% to 2% of them got diabetes. The people who didn't exercise, about 50% of those people got diabetes. So there's a big difference in just the 30 minutes, five days a week exercise program that you just heard about. Exercise, you heard, also decreases visceral fat. And that's what we want to decrease to get rid of metabolic syndrome. Now, how do I tell my patients to track their progress? The best website for tracking progress as you're going through your weight reduction program is choosemyplate.gov. And it's the USDA CDC website. And we tell all our patients about it. It, it tells you about all kinds of diets. You want to decide on a diet, you can go to this website. It tells you the pros and cons of all the diets. Almost all the diets known to man, beast, or your patient. And in addition to that, it also gives you pictures of portions. So if you have a portion control problem, you can look, you can see how much pizza you get, you can see how much broccoli you get in a serving. Very good website. Uh, we recommend it to every one of our patients. Or obviously, you can use an app. And there are a zillion of them, those carb counting apps I showed you. But I say to my patients, your phone, a partner to improve your health. You know, you notice people don't worry about you being late to get into the office now. They used to be annoyed because they had to sit not anymore. They're sitting there playing some game. And I come in and they say, hi. OK, it's time for your appointment. <laughs> you know? So uh, phones are really helpful for our patients. And they might as well use them to help with their food plan. Do you know there are, there are phone programs or apps you can get that will, if you don't put your lunchtime calories and carbs in there, they will keep calling you every five minutes until you put them in. So there are nagging apps. There's one of my patients like, um, put your money where your mouth is. And you can bet on how much weight you're going to lose. And you put in like $10. I have a patient that's won $500 losing weight. Because if you are the person that loses your goal weight, you get paid back. It's like a little gambling on your phone. OK, which food plan? Well, I'm just going to round up a few food plans for you. This is the most popular one this week. How many of you have patients going on the keto diet? I'm going to the keto diet, right. OK. Well. The keto diet should never be used in patients with type 1 diabetes. 
they have enough things that, that predispose them to diabetic ketoacidosis without using the keto diet. The whole idea is you eat very low carbohydrate, and then you eat a lot of fat. And in addition to that, you mobilize your own fat. I have to tell you, if you eat an 80% fat diet, the amount of your own fat you're going to mobilize is slim to none. So uh, we advocate for our patients a more reasonable diet. Instead of 5% carbs, we suggest that they use at least 50, 50 grams of carbs, but more likely, we suggest 100 grams of carbohydrate a day. 80 to 100 is the ADA guideline. So if your patient has diabetes, they need to use that. But in fact, most people will do much better on an 80 to 100 gram fat diet here. The 15% protein, we like to crank that up to 20% if they don't have renal insufficiency. And the fat, well, we let you eat what kind of fat you want. You're gonna have, you're gonna have 50 to 60% fat if it is unsaturated fat, okay? We need 10% saturated fat, but you can eat the unsaturated fat you want. In fact, if you follow the Mediterranean diet, you can eat up to 45% fat and it is monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fat. It's very low saturated fat and you'll do really quite well. So we say you can use the keto diet, but let me just change it a bit. <laughs> okay, the other thing that, that everybody is arguing about is animal versus vegetable. And we know that if you have a vegetable-based diet, you live longer. And this is the study I was telling you about where they have a 26-year follow-up. Now, these people obviously weren't an experiment. These people, as a population, used um, a vegetable-based diet. And the other people they compared them with used a more animal-based diet for their protein. So here we go. The high vegetable-based diet people used about 21.1% fat. The animal fat people, I mean, so the, they also used animal fat to an extent, but they only used about 15.5% animal fat. So most of their fat was vegetable fat. And that's the key to these diets. The, the high fat, uh, the other people in the control group basically, had a high animal fat diet. And their vegetable fat was 17.2, but their animal fat was 26.3. So these are two populations. They, weren't, they were just studied because one population was mainly vegetarian, the other population was mainly meat eaters. And we noticed that the animal fat people had more fat and more saturated fat, and mortality was much lower over the 26-year follow-up in the people who had high vegetable fat diets. We know that. We've known it forever. And uh, so th there's no arguing with it. Oh, vegetarian diets, though. Well, we don't do well with those in the United States. 90% of the people in the United States really like steak and hamburger. And so we just, we just don't do well with that, I'm sorry. So you're probably not gonna change your patients to a vegetarian diet, although people do very well on them. So what diet can we reasonably use that is a good diet? And you've known this for years. Every year we say the same thing. Uh, we all should be on it by now. It's the Mediterranean diet. And they did a, a meta-analysis of all the dietary studies, and they found out that these people need a medal here who did this. It's zillions of studies. And they said, OK, Mediterranean diet with fruit, with whole grains, with monounsaturated fat, hmm, definitely, that's the place where it's at. And again, you can vary your fat in the Mediterranean diet from about 25% to about almost 50% fat and still be in the Mediterranean diet. I think it's 48.6. But it's not saturated fat. The saturated fat level is really pretty low. This diet also slows cognitive decline. I'm glad you got back now because I want to tell you about cognitive decline in diets. We were talking about this while he was drinking his Pepsi out in the, the lobby there. And Remember what the Mediterranean diet is. I know. <laughs> it, is not, it is not wine on your red meat, OK? It's red meat a few times a month, OK? So most of my patients, I live in Texas, somewhere where we grow beef. It's one of the primary products of Texas. And so a vegetarian in our system is somebody who doesn't eat meat three times a day. 
So you're going to look here, red meat very seldom. It's mostly poultry, fish, a few times a week. And there are going to be whole days where you don't see any meat, red or otherwise. So some of my patients are using a variation of the Mediterranean diet. Most of them are not going to be vegetarians two or three days a week. But at least get your patients started on this. It's a reasonable food plan. Now, how about the diet to prevent diabetes? Well, here, caloric restriction is the key. You're trying to prevent type 2 diabetes, you've got to eat less. And that's the key. You want these people to lose weight. But they suggest that a low-carbohydrate diet, uh, this is the ADA suggestion, is 130 grams of carbs a day. But the fringe ADA people, the people that said, oh, that's too much, say 80 to 100 grams of carbohydrate a day. So you can have your patient focus either on 130 or 80 to 100 if they really want a low-carb diet. And you add monounsaturated fats to that, decreases insulin resistance significantly. Add exercise 30 minutes five times a week, you will probably prevent diabetes in about a third of your patients just by using this kind of a food plan. And most of your carbs should be high complex carbs, you know, squash, sweet potatoes, things like that. Okay, how about hypertension? You didn't mention, did you mention the DASH diet? No, you never mentioned the DASH, so I always have to mention the DASH diet. No, that's a really good diet, it helps with high blood pressure. <laughs> I'll let you comment on it during the question. We're going to be early, so I'll let you comment on it, okay? Again, it's vegetables, it's whole grains, it's fruits, it's, uh, there are meat, poultry, and fish. Uh oh that says less than two times, okay. Well, nuts, seeds, and berries. So again, it's not going to be um, a diet high in animal fats. It's a diet low in animal fats. And this diet also slows cognitive decline. Moderate exercise and hypertension, reasonable. Jumping rope, 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, the MIND diet is our last diet. And the MIND diet was designed <laughs> to preserve cognitive function. And it's whole grains, vegetables, beans and berries, nuts as a snack. And down here at the bottom, we have poultry twice a week, fish at least once a week, and my favorite at the very bottom, a glass of wine a day here. <laughs> but this is supposed to decrease the rate of cognitive decline, and who us can't do that? You know, the MIND diet says we need to avoid the unhealthy food groups, and particularly saturated fat, butter, cheese, fried or fast food, less than a serving a week. Oh my well. And this lowered Alzheimer's disease by 53% in the participants who strictly followed it, and 35% in the people who couldn't remember it and only followed it moderately well. But there, there is a flaw in this because they compared this, the people who are following it, to the people who had the usual United States diet. Give me a break. Okay, so they compared it to the people who are eating red meat two or three times a week, who are eating uh, you know, animal fats for the primary diet. But at any rate, if you want to follow this diet, they do have a decrease in the incidence uh, of development of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Okay, well that's it. I'm gonna end a little bit early because we all want to get to the beach here. And I want to give Dr. DePetty time to comment on his thoughts about the DASH diet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to stick around and answer them. The rest of you can hit the beach. Uh, <clears throat> Ronnie, you know anything about this cool sculpting that they keep? Oh, cool sculpting. You know, that is, the neatest, that is the neatest thing. It turns out that fat cells are less resistant to cold than normal cells like liver or skin or muscle tissue. And so what you can do is you can lower the temperature in a given area of, that you want to lose fat down to below the tolerance of the fat cells and you actually do freeze the adipocytes. And the other tissue, although it's a little uncomfortable, uh, you know, is okay. And it's, it's a, it works. It gets rid of adipocytes. 
The problem with them is that unfortunately, uh, you know, our brain cells don't proliferate again, our, our muscle and joint cells go to pot, but the adipocytes can multiply even if you're 80 years old. <laughs> There's something unfair about that. So they come back, it's like a paniculectomy, you know, if you wait long enough, it, the fat comes back. But it works. It's fairly expensive, but it really works quite well. And for a short term, you know, you want to go to the wedding and you want to just get rid of some of this around the belly fat, they can do that. Where do eggs fit in your diets? Where do eggs fit in? You know, if you are in the uh, original one where I said the 26 year follow up, you can have eggs. It's that um, it, eggs are fine. And as a matter of fact, the American Heart Association says that eggs are fine. Uh, most of us, it's not a problem with the cholesterol that we eat, it's a problem with the cholesterol that we make ourselves. And so eggs can fit in, into any one of these except a strict vegetarian diet. But most of my vegetarian, my vegetarian quotation marks people are on a lacto-ovo-vegetarian diet, so they eat eggs. Otherwise, it's very hard on a true vegetarian diet to get enough protein in because you're eating nuts and rice and, and beans and corn, and there's a lot of calories in those, so it's hard to lose weight on those diets. Okay, well, thank you very much, got, and have a good well, time. Got one minute, yeah, one, 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 one more. Okay. Hey, this slide was in the syllabus. I didn't see it up at the front, but um, just um, on the endocrine, endocrine disruptors, there's a little mention about possibly not breastfeeding after six ah, months. Ah, I took that out of the, it was in the syllabus, but I didn't put it up here. But I'll have to tell you that in places like, this is the World Health Organization that's saying this, okay? And in places like Japan, where the water supply and the breast milk have endocrine disruptors, they have mercury, they're saying to people, probably shouldn't breastfeed longer than six months because they can make food that is healthier for your baby and doesn't have endocrine disruptors. You, you've seen that Gerber commercial where the little baby's face comes on the farm, the barn, and they say, we make food for your baby. They don't have any endocrine disruptors in their food. Their food is all grown specially, so there are no endocrine disruptors. In the United States, not so much of a problem, but we do know that um, polybrominated diphenyl ethers can be found in mammalian breast milk. So endocrine disruptors are beginning to get into the breast milk. And in some countries, they are in it for sure. And so probably you're feeding your baby along with good things, you're feeding them not so good things. So they're saying we probably can do better with formula that doesn't have endocrine disruptors in it in some places in the world. But when I put that in there, um, I said, well, people are gonna ask about that. So I <laughs> whipped it out. <laughs> but that's, that's it. In the United States, we're not so, it's not so problematic. But in some areas of the world, and in some cultures that have things that are made differently, that is gonna be a problem. Interesting, thank you. Anybody mm -hmm. else? Okay, we'll see you tomorrow.